All right. Well, we'll just let people coming in uh, as we get started here. We're going to be sensitive to everybody's time. So again, uh, let's get started here. So hello, welcome to the 1AZ Wealth webinar on building a strong financial future for strategies for ages 30s, 40s, and 50s. As I said, we had over 400 people register for this event, one of our most popular webinars to date. So we're excited to bring this along. So <clears throat> my name's Tom Mitchell, and I have the honor of leading the 1AZ Wealth Management team of advisors located here at the 1AZ Credit Union. Our full-time professional team of advisors are assisting clients and members of the 1AZ Credit Union all over the great state of Arizona. And we are excited to bring you these kind of educational topics directly to you with these kinds of webinars on topics like Social Security, Medicare, women in investing, uh, et cetera. And we have a lot more planned for this coming year. Matter of fact, as a heads up, on uh, in May, May the 18th, uh, we're going to be doing a webinar on understanding your rollover options and retirement income strategies. We're asked, we've been asked that quite a bit. People are changing jobs. People are getting closer to retirement or are on the verge of retiring. And they have these monies in their 401k plans and, and profit sharing plans. And they want to know what are their options. So we're going to, we've put together a very uh, great webinar just on that specific topic on understanding your rollover options. It's going to be educationally based. It's going to give you some a lot of good insights and also some tax strategies of how to do it right uh, to maximize your benefits. So again, May the 18th, you can go out to our website and actually register for it now. First here for informational purposes, this is our informational slide. It contains our legal disclosures for your convenience. Again, always you want to check out our website, 1azwealth.com for a lot of, uh, of webinar events that we have coming up. <clears throat> for better audio, the webinar is going to be in listen-only mode, and we will be fielding your questions at the end of today's webinar. Please feel free to email your questions to 1azwealth at 1azcu.com. We will be compiling those questions and answering them. Uh, I promise you, if we don't get to your question, we will respond to you directly. We actually had over 30 questions already submitted, so trust me, we've got lots to talk about. And we're going to have some great questions and answer times at the end of the presentation. So stay tuned for that. Again, for more information about our program and who 1AZ Wealth is, please go out and check us out. You can actually use your phone, your mobile device, and scan the QR code that's on the screen right now. And that'll take you right to our website. I also urge you to connect with us on one of your social media platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, or even YouTube. So let's get started. Our topic again is on building a strong financial future, strategies for ages 30s, 40s, and 50s. And what I did is we turned to one of our members of our wealth management team, and that is Michael Kincaid. Michael Kincaid joined our team in 2021, but actually he has quite a few years of experience under his belt. He started in the industry back in 1995. Uh, he actually is from Ohio and now calls Arizona home. Uh, and has really developed a lot of skill sets and knowledge in retirement and educational planning, insurance analysis, wealth transfer techniques, as well as investment strategies. Mm -hmm. He's also earned the, uh, uh, the designation of the Chartered Retirement Planning Counselor, the CRPC, which is conferred by the College for Financial Planning. So I'm excited to have Michael going to be doing a, a bulk of the presentation and I'll be asked to come back and do some of the final slides. So, Michael, I'm going to turn this over to you. Are you there? Good, after, good afternoon, Tom. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. All right. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Tom. And thank you to everyone who's attending the webinar today. Uh, we appreciate you blocking out your time on your calendar this Tuesday. As Tom mentioned, we have a great team of advisors here at 1AZ. And I primarily work with members and clients in the East Valley. So you can see me routinely in our offices in Queen Creek, Gilbert, Tempe, and the downtown Phoenix office on Monroe. So please, if you see me in the office, make sure you come by and say hello to me. I'd love to meet you. This slide provides some of the agenda items that we plan on discussing today. We hope to share some 
good basic nuggets to help you improve your saving and investing strategies. So let's jump into our first agenda item, why save for retirement. Listed below are some of the bullet points on why we need to save for retirement. Longer lifespans. People are living longer with medical advancements and improved phar pharmaceuticals, which means people are enjoying healthier and more active lifestyles. So the actual cost of retirement increases as we live longer. As we live longer, we start seeing rising costs to our healthcare. So see how that works? Living longer is good, but costs continue to rise. And finally, the future of Social Security solvency remains in the news in talks of extending retirement age qualifications. It's like a political football we see all the time. This requires everyone to look again at their retirement income strategies and how to supplement it with their personal savings. Your retirement planning must take these facts into consideration. Okay, are we saving the right amount? Sadly, most do not properly prepare for retirement. So let's highlight some of the key basic steps. First, you'll wanna consider when you're thinking about retiring, number one, is that age 50, 60, 70? We need to define it. And when do you want to? Second is estimating your annual retirement income need. Experts indicate you'll need 60 to 80% of your final working year salary each year during retirement. A benchmark for savings towards that goal is saving 10% or more of your income during your working years. Third, investing for retirement should be one of the top financial priorities even if you have over 30 years away. You'll need to estimate how much you'll need in retirement. According to the Employee Benefits Research Institute, those who take the time to establish a savings goal are also more likely to set aside money for retirement. Fourth, outpacing inflation is important when setting this goal since over time, the purchasing power of your assets may be eroded. We'll look at that more on the next slide. And finally, a tip. An easy way to increase your annual savings rate is to divert a portion of your annual pay raises into your retirement savings. Okay, here we go. Let's look at the big I word. If we've seen our prices go up at the gas pump, the price of eggs, the price of groceries, we've all seen it and felt it. One of the negative forces working against all savers and investors is the word inflation. Simply stated, inflation is the increased cost of goods and services. So let's look at the slide and let's look how a simple 3% inflation rate can impact your income. Starting on the far left-hand side, you'll see $1,000 in today's time can erode away to $553 a month in just 20 years. While the inflation rate has historically been low in the two to 3% range, history shows that it has varied considerably throughout the years. And as you can see from this example, the further away you are from retirement, the more inflation can reduce your future purchasing power and the more important it is for you to choose investments that can potentially help you stay ahead of inflation. Here's the takeaway from this slide. We need to grow our retirement assets to keep pace or exceed inflation. This is so, so true, Michael. We see this time and time again, and particularly with our new spike in inflation rates that we're currently experiencing. No doubt. So here's the call to action. We need to plan ourselves to have a successful retirement. So what options are available to you to help you accumulate money for retirement? There are the traditional and Roth IRAs. The traditional IRA grows tax deferred while the Roth IRA grows tax free. With Roth type plans, qualified contributions are after tax and the retirement distributions are tax free. 
If your employer has a retirement savings plan like a 401k, that can also be help you pursue your retirement goal. With a traditional 401k, the money you contribute is deducted from your pay before income taxes are taken out. So you save on taxes today. It will also grow tax deferred. And when you take your retirement distributions, then that will be taxable income. A real plus of some retirement savings plans is the employer may match on part or all of the contributions you make to the plan. If a plan has a matching formula, it's like getting bonus or free money on top of your salary. I'm gonna share some numbers, so bear with me on this. Currently for 2023, you may contribute up to 20,500 into a 401k plan. This amount typically increases each year by the IRS to reflect the rise of inflation. For IRAs, you can contribute up to 6,500 to an IRA for 2023. In addition, individuals age 50 and over can also make up what's called catch-up contributions to their 401k plan and IRAs. For 2023, the catch-up maximum is an additional $6,500, which totals $27,000. And for IRAs, the catch-up amount is $1,000, which brings the total to $7,500. Now that we've done some planning and some number crunching, let's discuss how choosing our investment mix. There are three basic asset classes, stocks, bonds, and money market instruments. Each class has different risk return options, and most retirement plans utilize mutual funds to help with diversification and choices. Asset allocation is the process of diversifying your money in different asset classes to help you pursue the returns while manage, managing your risk. How do we choose which asset allocation is appropriate for you? The next step is understanding your own personal tolerance for investment risk and how it can work in conjunction with your time horizon. Your investment risk is determined by your investment time frame and your personal feelings about risk. Stocks involve the greatest short-term risk of price fluctuations. We'll look at that in a minute. But over the long term, they have historically outperformed other types of investments. But past performance can't guarantee future results. There's always the chance that you will lose money in the stock market and maybe even in the bond market. It did that in 2022. Consider, however, your time horizon can help you be more or less tolerant towards investment risk. Let me just add something here, Michael. I'll call this out as a real critical area in everybody's planning process. I like to use the phrase, people don't know how much risk to take until they've taken too much, and then usually it's too late. So we want to get ahead of that. So there are ways and there's techniques to assess your level of risk. We call it sleep factor. What is your sleep factor? So that you'll know how well you can sleep at night so that you can actually know you're selecting the investment strategy that's gonna be best for you. So every investment has a level of risk. And again, it's assessing how comfortable you are to those different levels. So let's take a look at this next chart. That's a great call out, Tom. Um, let's look at asset allocation. This by far is one of my favorite charts to share. And don't worry, it's not the periodic chart of chemicals from science class. <laughs> we are often asked, what is the best investment to buy? Well, it's nearly impossible to pick or guess what's gonna be the best investment category next year. So let's take a look at the chart. We call it the jelly bean chart because like jelly beans, it has so many colors each color representing a different investment category. They are ranked by their actual performance during the given year. And you can see there's a lot of volatility of change from one year to the next. One prudent method of investing is asset allocating your investment portfolio across multiple categories. 
So you can possibly generate a solid average with less major volatility. The dark gray box is what we call a diversified portfolio. It shows how that would have performed year over year. You can see it has performed with less volatility over the last 20 years, and that shows more of a balance as it's linear across the chart. So the question you need to ask yourself is, how diversified is your portfolio? Yeah, so, so true. You know, some people think they can just pick with one strategy and just sit with it. Sometimes that'll work, maybe on the short run, but not necessarily for the long run. And you can clearly see how volatile each of these different categories are by simply looking at the colors, Michael. Yeah, I think we do have a question on that at the end, Tom. And you can see it's very hard to pick which is going to be the best category from year to year. Yeah. Another topic to discuss is taking the long view. Investing during sharp market declines can induce anxiety where the fear of losing money can provoke strong emotions to sell in attempt to alleviate the short-term pain. However, we believe individuals may find comfort in taking the long-term view during times of market volatility. While it's common to have negative equity returns in the short run, the probability of having annualized negative returns has been diminished the longer the holding period, according to historical data. Noting that past performance is not indicative of future returns, history has shown that since 1950, as illustrated on the chart, the lowest annualized 20-year return for large cap stocks has been 5.6%. That's more than double the 2.4% lowest annualized 20-year return for U.S. intermediate government bonds over the rolling period. You know, this again illustrates the power of time. The most important asset that a lot of the people that are in their 30s and their 40s and in their 50s as well is you still have time. But as you continue to march on, as you continue to age, you have less of it. So the most important thing is to take advantage of that time horizon that you have and knowing that the longer you can have in that time investment strategy, the longer term possibility of great performance may happen. Well said. Let's look at another strategy. Um, it's important to remember, as Tom kind of mentioned, investing is a marathon and not a sprint. We looked at diversification. We looked at taking the long view. So let's look at a strategy we call dollar cost averaging or DCA. DCA is the process by which helps you take emotions out of the long-term savings process. By saving on a consistent and regular basis, you'll end up buying during the ups and the inevitable downs of the market. This strategy could lead to lower average cost per share over time. So let's look at the action and plan. The chart shows how DCA works. In this example, the client invests $100 a month into the mutual fund over the next 12 months. Even though the price of the mutual fund in our example fluctuated, the dollar cost averaging strategy ended up with a greater amount of total shares and a greater to total portfolio value at the end of 12 months. So to note there, Tom, it's actually capable to make money in a flat market as you're buying at those cheaper share prices. Yeah, you know, you're right. And tip, we also look at volatility can be a friend. Volatility gives you an opportunity to make investments at lower values, lower prices on things at, at, the, at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. So let's remember, you want to continue to review your asset allocation at least at a minimum once a year. You'll want to make, make and modify changes as your needs change. And please reach out and work with a financial professional. We are happy. We are here ready to help you. That's our mission. Let's look at some other important planning items for your 30s and 40s. 
For many families, saving for college expense is the biggest hurdle after retirement savings. When we discuss the historical average of inflation being 2 to 3%, college expense inflation is actually closer to 4 to 6%. It's important, though, that there are many options to help you offset college expenses. There's loans, scholarships, and grants. Luckily, there are many tax advantage vehicles for college savings. The Coverdale Education Savings Account, the penalty-free IRA withdrawals, prepaid tuition programs, and the College 529 Savings Plan, which offers tax-free growth and is also very flexible. Michael, we have, I think, a couple questions later we'll address on this very topic of college planning. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to talking to it. Let's move on to some basic prote uh, protection strategies. A question to consider, and it's a hard question. How will your family cope financially if you unexpectedly become disabled or pass away? One way to protect yourself is with life and disability income insurance. Most employers have some coverage options available, and it's always a good idea to take advantage of that, as well as have coverage outside of the employer also. There's many different types of plans, so we suggest meeting with your financial advisor to discuss what works best for you. Do you need an estate plan? An estate plan may include strategies for selecting beneficiaries, the creation of trust, plans for charitable giving, and wills. Some basic documents to consider. Power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, will, and a trust. So Tom, let's take a look at having a valid will. Everyone should have a, a will. If you die without one, your assets will be distributed by the court through a process known as probate, according to state laws. Probate can cost money and take time. An individual may leave specific items of jewelry, heirlooms, furniture, cash bequests, and be certain that they'll pass to the proper persons without a will, written or oral instructions may not be followed. What does it mean to name a guardian in your will? When parents die leaving minor children, each child's share of the estate must be held in guardianship account until he or she reaches age 18 or 21, at which time the entire remaining share is distributed outright. Trust provisions can be placed in the will to help defer these distributions until a more mature age. Next is choosing an executor. The duties of the executor of an estate will typically be a qualified individual or a corporate trust attorney. Although this advantage cannot be measured in dollars and cents, when the estate is in an emotional load is lifted off the person who is connected with his or her family's well-being. Tom, do you want to speak to anything about that? Well, I will tell you, a will, no matter how old you are, young and old, it's truly your last, they call it your last will and testament. What does that mean? It means it is your last statement of how you wish your estates, your estate assets, and how you would like to have things handled after your passing. So please, I urge everybody, you can go online, you can get them done very easily and simply uh, you can seek qualified uh, legal assistance in this area as well for more complicated estate planning. But if anything, everyone should have a basic will. Uh, and as you mentioned, a few of the other documents as well. The power of attorney uh, is important. Uh, the guardianship in that will needs to be stated, etc. Uh, very, very important provisions. So please, we urge you to do that. And as we meet with our clients, we, we ask you point blank, do you have a will? And there's about 40 to 50% of the people don't have one. So many of us on this call right now probably don't have one. So I urge you to get one. Perfect. Okay, Michael, you wanted me to kind of cover this section, the 50 and older group. I'm not sure why, but <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> so let me talk about the 50s and older because now we're coming into this last home stretch. And I, I kind of relate it to a baseball game. 
you know, it's like the seventh inning stretch, right? When you get up during that seventh inning stretch and you look over at that scoreboard, you generally have a good idea who's going to maybe win that game. Well, when you get into your 50s, that's exactly what you need to be doing is looking at your accumulated assets. That's going to give you a pretty good pulse on how well you've accumulated assets for your retirement. Sometimes it's a real wake-up call and there's some real catch-up that some people need to do. But I really want to call out when we're in that 50 zone, it's really important to now at that point, start educating yourself, educating yourself on retirement income strategies to, so that you can actually maximize your income streams to meet your retirement objectives. So I also want to make it clear, everybody changes jobs throughout their career. And when you're retiring, that's exactly what you're going to do too, is stepping away and you're going to have a decision to make with all that retirement savings money. So anytime you change a job, or even when you're about to retire, you're going to have to make some big decisions. I'm just going to highlight them here is you could leave your retirement savings at your current employer. Some employers will allow you to keep your money there. You could also transfer that retirement monies over to a new employer. If you decide to take a different job, somewhere else, you can roll that over to the new company plan. Again, if the plan provision provides. One of the third options there is to roll over your, your savings that you've accumulated into your own personal IRA. That way you have more control, you can manage it, you'll actually be able to track it, uh, et cetera. Or some people do take a lump sum. Now, I caution people on lump sums because when you take the lump sum, you're also dealing with lump sum taxes. So you have to plan accordingly of how you're going to plan out the taxation of that money. So uh, another area I want to talk about is this whole transfer when you move it from a traditional IRA to a traditional IRA. If you do that, I want to make one call out. And I urge all of you on this call, if you ever do a transfer, make sure it's a direct transfer or a direct rollover, they call it. Using the word direct is important because the money will go directly to your new retirement account, like your IRA, or even your new uh, retirement account at your new employer. You don't want to take personal possession if you don't have to, because you don't want to have any of the tax withheld on it, or even have the chance of a tax liability being created. By moving it directly from one account to the next account directly, and you take no personal and constructive receipt of it, that allows that tax deferred treatment to continue. So I urge you all to do that. Now, let me also make a call out on uh, the uh, a comment that I share with some people about is fair also uh, equal or is equal being fair? What am I talking about here? I'm talking about when you uh, provide a benefit or you're a beneficiary to your IRA account, I'll use a case example of a client that we recently had, had two adult children and the client wanted to basically be equal. He felt being equal is fair. All right, so the provision was made that half would go to one child, the other half would go to the second child. Well, it just so happens it may not be actually fair. What do I mean? Well, when the person passed away, the money were divided equally. So 100,000 went to one, 100,000 went to the second child. Well, the reality is each of the children were actually at different tax brackets. One was on a very high tax bracket, about a 35% tax bracket, and the other one was only at a very low tax bracket, about a 15. So one, the one child actually saw after tax only $65,000, and the other child actually saw $85,000 in benefit. So yes, the equal of being, let me share what the distribution would look like on an equal basis, but the reality is, was it really fair? He wanted both children to receive the same in net proceeds, because ultimately they wanted it to also go on to the grandchildren. So clearly a call out. And that's just a little planning example of just what, oh, I'll just simply go 50-50. Well, sometimes you need to be thinking about it a little bit more and the actual effects and how it would go. The last one I want to mention here is uh, 
is this create a personally owned pension solution. <clears throat> this is a strategy that more and people are going to have to think about. As you have accumulated your assets, and that's exactly what you've done, you've accumulated your assets over many, many years, possibly decades. Now you're going to begin the decumulation. Well, the decumulation, if it's not managed or controlled correctly, you could maybe lose money or run out of money. You don't want to do that for sure. So how do we manage that? Well, some people will actually pensionize or annuitize, if you will, some of their retirement nest egg so that they will have the guarantees in place so that some or, or a good chunk of their monies would be safe and secured and provide a guaranteed income that they wouldn't outlive. So I'm not here to profess and to promote any particular annuity or, or pension for that matter, but I do want you to understand that's a valuable strategy to consider and to evaluate as you get into this and you work with your uh, advisor. You want to make sure what's going to keep you up at night, what's going to also make you sleep well at night. So I want to make sure we address those. So that's a key area when you're leaving jobs and when you're now coming into that home stretch towards retirement. The Tom, next I'd like to just add to that. Um, sure. You absolutely knocked it out of the park. Retiree's biggest fear is running out of money. It is. So it, you address that really well. Yeah, it truly is. Running out of money is a great fear. And we want people not to have that fear. So let's talk, we'll walk through that. And as you meet with your any of your advisors, whether it's one of the 1AZ one, one, one Wealth Management Team or somewhere else, I urge you, please investigate those options. Now, another, another category I do wanna to touch on because this is an important category. Uh, many times we don't pay much attention to this, but this is about being a caregiver. So if you are, or you are potentially may need to provide care for a family member, I'm talking about maybe a, a, another adult, a, another parent, or even a child for that matter, that you're providing care for in your retirement time. Understand that uh, it can be a real emotional drain, a physical drain, uh, and a financial drain. So what we wanna make sure is you understand that's a reality. I just read a study, 38 million adults in the United States, 38 million uh, actually provided unpaid, unpaid care for an adult or a child in the year of 2021. That's an estimated value of about $600 billion. So that's a huge amount of money. Now, what did that come from or how did it happen? Well, it actually impacted those caregivers because if you're in that caregiving process, you're not going to be able to generate some of the income that you currently generate from your other from your other jobs, perhaps. You may get a reduced pension benefit or your Social Security benefits could be reduced because you have less being paid into Social Security. You have out-of-pocket expenses that you may have as well. Um, so clearly, it is important to understand um, Caregiving is a big, big responsibility. It comes with a cost. It needs to be planned for. Long-term care insurance sometimes can help, not always, but I want you to understand that is a, a possibility and should be evaluated and considered. They're different. A lot of long-term care policies have changed dramatically over the last five to 10 years. So I urge you to take a look at that. The sooner you look at it, the better, because if you wanna look at that as an option, you want to make sure you get it when you're healthy and you can get the get the coverage. But more importantly, I want you to understand this is an area of planning that a lot of people avoid, they don't talk about, and they don't think it come, happens. But about 40% of the people living beyond 65 will experience long-term care. All right, let's talk about another thing, and that's taxes. Wow. You know, there's an old adage, an old saying that says there's two things that are for sure in life right? Death and taxes. Well, that may be true, uh, but you can be more proactive in your tax planning. April the 15th, when it rolls around and you're doing your taxes, that's not tax planning. That's tax pre pre preparation and tax reporting. You need to be doing the planning before you do your tax returns, actually, so that you'll know in advance what your taxation may look like. Let me ask this question. And I usually do this in a large group is do you know the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion? 
tax avoidance, tax evasion. Well, one is legal and one will get you time in jail. So we want to avoid taxes. That's the legal one. You don't want to evade taxes. What we want to do is show you and help you and make you take advantage of tax laws the way they're written so that you can maximize your benefits. You can be proactive in planning viable strategies to avoid taxes. Very, very important. You can also arrange your investments and your income to be tax-free. Uh, it could be taxable, federal, or maybe just state. Uh, it could be tax-deferred. Another one is tax-advantaged, things that can be long-term gain-oriented. There are a number of tax laws that are continuing to change in the recent years. One in particular is like the inherited IRA accounts. We just talked about IRA accounts. Did you know a non-spousal beneficiary? That means a non-spouse that receives an IRA as a beneficiary actually has less options now than they did before. Again, you need to plan that out, talk through that, and then have a strategy and make sure everybody understands it. So that's a key call out I like to make. And then I mentioned this area about the inherited IRAs and making sure is fair equal and is equal fair. I went through that example uh, on that prior slide, but very important to understand the difference of uh, tax planning can impact somebody. This is critically important is planning ahead of time, not just waiting to do the tax return when it's too late. All right, let's talk about some action plans as I kind of close up. I have a couple more slides, but let me close this up a little bit here. All right, first, uh, we want uh, you know you to have the best chance to retirement. So we want to increase your chances of an enjoyment retirement by establishing those goals. Do you have a goal, whether you're 30, 40, 50? It doesn't matter. Do you know what your goal is? And are you taking advantages of the opportunities to contribute or to save towards that? We need to do that. No one's going to do it for you. You must do it. Try to contribute the maximum possible. And again, as, as Michael mentioned earlier, if you're over the age of 50, you can actually make catch-up contributions. That's actually more money you can set aside legally, tax-deferred or tax-advantaged so that you can save more for retirement. You can also think about the mix of your investments. Make sure you have the mix that will actually help you reduce your risk. You also want to be thinking about the allocation. Make sure that's changed and reviewed regularly with your advisor, making sure you're not, again, taking on more risk than you need to. A key call out is inflation as well. We talked about that earlier, making sure that you have investments that are not just stale, but investments that can grow with inflation effects. So that's a key call out. This next slide I like a lot because this actually comes to us from Fidelity. There was a benchmarking study that they did and it calls out how much money do people need to have in their retirement accounts uh, at their various ages as they grow closer and closer towards retirement? The question is, how do you measure up? Take a look at the chart. So if you're in your 30s, do you have somewhere around one times your income? Yeah, that's a big number maybe for some, but <clears throat> I do want you to understand, you've got to get started sooner versus later. If you get to the mid, if you get to 40, you should have three times your, three times your salary in, uh, in re your retirement savings accounts by age uh, 40. When you get to 50, it should be about six times. So now you're coming into that home stretch because that's when things really start to grow. By, by the time you're 60, it should be eight. And by the time you're 67, it should be about 10 times. What is that? Does that mean to be a lot of money? It is. That's what you're going to need, a lot of money when it comes time to retirement. Don't think it's just going to come out of the sky and uh, by accident. It's something you have to set aside, invest, uh, that you've done very well on your earning lives during your earning stage of your life so that you can enjoy it in your later years during your retirement years. Okay? Good chart, good follow-up. Let me close it up here with some closing thoughts. And then we have lots of questions we want to get to with people. All right. We want to make sure you have a strong financial future, but your financial future is up to who? Who is it? It's you, right? The people that are on this webinar, you have tools and there's resources available that you can take advantage of. And we have those resources 
available to you. If you haven't yet focused on building up a nest egg for retirement, please start now. By taking advantage of those opportunities to defer taxes on your investment earnings, you can save up a very sizable amount of money. By planning ahead, you can put that compounding interest to work for you. Invest your savings appropriately, and then based upon your time and your risk tolerance to increase your chances of meeting your goals. Now, again, as Michael mentioned this too earlier, if you have any dependents providing for their future, their future security can help you give confidence. Review your insurance needs and make sure you do have a valid will. And then last but not least is please seek professional help. It's there. And one of the advantages of 1AZ Wealth, we sit here within 1AZ Credit Union, making ourselves available to any of the members of 1AZ Credit Union so that we can help you. We can give you guidance. We can actually do financial planning and financial strategy work and discussions with you. Our role is to be an educator for you so that you'll have a successful retirement or a successful life ahead. Again, you want to keep up to date with all those tax rules changes too. They're always changing. So please keep those in mind. So Michael, we've got a lot of questions coming in. We've had questions submitted earlier. So I'd like to kind of jump right in. Uh, I know we have about maybe 15 minutes. So let's get through as many questions as we can. All right. Great. All right. The first question that came in was about actually college savings for kids. <laughs> college savings for kids. What about it? How, what, are, what do I do? You want to touch that? Absolutely. I consider myself a pro in this. Um, I love the topic and I have three kids uh, ranging from age 15 to 23. So I've tackled this myself. And I think the college 529 savings plan has many advantages that make it look like an attractive option. Number one, we know that money can grow taxable, tax deferred, or tax free. The 529 plan allows money to grow tax-free as long as it's used for qualified expenses. Another good positive thing about the 529 plan is it can be used at any school at any state. It can also be used for K through 12 education, undergrad, grad school, believe it or not, CE courses, loan repayments, training programs, and trade schools. You can use it for fees, room and board, books, although I'm not sure if they have books anymore. A lot of colleges are online, but um, mm -hmm. supplies, technology, and you can get started for as little as $250, Tom, wow. and save $25 a month. So the entry into saving for college is small. I highly recommend looking into the 529 plan. Yeah. Uh, I would also mention, I know many of us on this call are between 30 and 50 or in our 50s. Tell you what, turn to some of the grandparents uh, and ask them, uh, you know what, maybe if they could help contribute towards a 529 plan for one of the kids will really help out a lot too. Trust me, as a grandparent that I am, I am doing that for my grandkids and I know my family appreciates it. So I urge you to think about talking to your family members on it as well. Another question here. Uh, actually, we had a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to combine a couple of them. Here is, here is should I roll over my old government retirement account into an IRA or leave it where it's at? Another question that's very similar is, when leaving a job, is it better to roll over the retirement plan at your new employer plan, or is it to roll over to an IRA better? Well, you know what? It's hard to give a real answer, yes or no, or what's the best. It really comes down to the individual and what your needs are and what your desires are. Each plan has its own uh, advantages as far as investment selections. There may be limitation on what you can invest in. It may be also limited on what you can uh, earn in it. So it's important to sit down with an advisor, a professional advisor can understand it, look at it, examine it, and give you guidance. Part of a, a job of being a fiduciary is to do that, is sit down, look at your situation, and talk through the scenarios. Now, if I had to give a broad brush, uh, many, many times it happens to be uh, a rolling it over to your own personal IRA can be better for you long-term because of more flexibilities, more controls, 
Um, and uh, just for simplicity, you, it's a great way to consolidate all your different retirement monies. But again, one shoe does not fit or one IRA does not fit uh, everybody's situation. So I'd urge you to take a look at it and examine it um, and uh, meet with an advisor and they'll give you all those advantages. Better yet, even come to the webinar that we're going to have in May and we'll, we'll talk more about it as well. Tom, right, I'll just number... add to that, if I could quickly, rolling yeah. it over into another, the new employer's retirement plan could also have some loan provisions which allow you to borrow against your 401k. I'm not suggesting that, but that may be one of the things that you want to consider when you're uh, trying to make that decision. You're right, Michael. It comes down to really each person's situation and what their age is and their life, where they are in their life stage. That's absolutely yeah. right. Uh, another question. I just turned 50 and I hope to retire within, uh, within about 10 years with a 401k pension and miscellaneous. What about health care? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you use the word pension, which is great. There are fewer and fewer pensions out there in the market, as you might know, all of us out there in the market, people in their 30s and 40s probably don't know what a pension is. But pensions were a retirement account that were provided by employers many years ago uh, that actually did provide a stable, steady stream of income for people. More and more have shifted to the 401k concept, which is really an asset accumulator so that you now will have that nest egg when you retire and you need to make decisions on it. But to your question, what about health care? Well, health care actually uh, kicks in with Medicare when it comes to age 65. So at age 65, you're going to be eligible to apply for Medicare. But until then, you're on your own. Sorry. Uh, but that's part of the planning is if you do want to retire early and you want to make sure you do have health insurance coverage, you want to make sure you have it. So you can get it from various private sources. Perhaps maybe you just take a part-time job and where they may have it as well. But more importantly, you have to think through it uh, and plan accordingly. You don't want to all of a sudden wake up one day and say, oops, I need insurance. And you didn't think about it or price it out. It can be quite costly. So that's why you always like to use the advantage of group, group health insurance if you can. All right, here's another one is how would you approach deciding whether to invest in a Roth or a traditional on top of the 401k. So maybe you talk through that. You want to cover that one? You think about the progression, you know? Yeah. Um, and then Roth or traditional. I did make some notes on this question because there are some okay. topics I really wanted to hit. But um, one of the questions I would ask of your 401k provider is, does the plan offer both a pre-tax contribution and or a Roth after-tax contribution. So that's kind of one thing you want to look into. Um, does the company offer match or as we talked about earlier, free money? Mm -hmm. But typically saving within the company plan is traditionally the easiest way to save or what we like to call sometimes paying yourself first. It's easy, it's payroll deducted. Um, and most likely there is a match. So once you've maxed out that employer contribution option, then I would definitely consider the benefits of either the traditional IRA, which as we mentioned, grows tax deferred, or the Roth. Um, it is important to note with the Roth, there are some income limitation phase out options with the Roth. So you always wanna make sure that if, if you're reaching an income high enough that you may want to con uh, look consult with your tax preparer uh, tax professional to make sure that you still qualify for the Roth but I would definitely focus on maximizing the 401k and then moving over into the traditional or the Roth IRA yep yep well we've got more questions here again anybody that has a question again email us at uh, 1az wealth at 1azcu.com and we will answer your questions directly uh, let's keep going down the list that we have so far. Uh, here, uh, how does owning a small business change or affect what you're talking about today? Well, um, actually, we are planning to do a webinar specifically for business owners. That's going to be this summer. Uh, the dates are being finalized as we speak. 
So I uh, ask you to be aware of it and we'll keep you posted, but literally anybody else on this call, uh, watch for our webinar on small businesses and business owners, because that's a specific area of lots of information and lots <clears throat> of great inf uh, strategies that we can play out. Um, next question is top tips to implement now for rebooting or catching up for people in their 50s after two years of income loss from a COVID era. Okay. So, wow. So you want to, you want to touch on that, Mike? Yeah. And, and, and we did have a, a, a couple years of tough times. Yeah, uh, we did. So, you know, I'm going to keep it really simple on this one. Let's start. Starting is, is the hardest battle is, is to start. Um, you also want to know your numbers. As we mentioned in the webinar, there are allotments for folks over 50 that they can do catch up provisions. And then commit to the process. Uh, understand and, and that we need to do, do it ourselves, as Tom mentioned earlier. We got to take control. We got to start. We got to know the numbers and we got to commit to the process. Yep. Okay. Another question. We still have about eight minutes left before we're closing down the webinar. So let's keep going. What about investments for 70 plus? I plan on being around for another 20 years. Well, yes, I am too. So yes, the most important is we don't want our money to run out before we do, right? So there are some strategies and there's some methods and there's some vehicles that you need to look at to help you. I mentioned it a little bit earlier about privatizing your own, your own retirement nest egg for in a pension type of a solution. That can be a great way to help provide stability in some of these uncertain times. If you have all your money in volatile stocks or a volatile investment category and markets are down and you still need to take money out for income, that can really hurt hard. So the most important thing is we wanna make sure our stable income streams are organized and planned out accordingly. So good stuff there. I ask you to meet with an advisor, talk about it. And yes, there are some great, great sol solutions and strategies that can help you make sure you accomplish all of that. Another question is, is a Roth IRA or traditional IRA better? What's the difference uh, between a 401k and an IRA? I guess we, we kind of covered some of that already, Michael. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'd add? like to add briefly to that. Um, clearly, we've talked about the, the tax-free benefit of the Roth IRA. Uh, but I do want to point out on our website, 1azwealth.com, there's a section in the top right called resources. And then there's calculators. There are some excellent free tools that you can go and crunch some of these numbers. Um, you'll be able to see the, the benefit of the tax-free growth versus the tax-deferred growth. Um, one other thing that hasn't been mentioned, the traditional IRA does have a required minimum distribution um, requirement to it at age 73 as of right now, which basically means as this money grows tax deferred, you're going to have to start pulling money out with the Roth IRA. You do not have that required minimum distribution. So those are a couple different things that we haven't really touched on that I thought would be good. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, believe it or not, here's another Roth question. I have a Roth uh, IRA since I was age 20. Um, I see no growth. What can I do to maximize the growth so I can retire early? Okay. Um, I like to think of the Roth, uh, the Roth as a school bus. Here's where I'm going with that. The Roth is the vehicle that will give us tax-free growth. Now we have to choose the seats on the bus which is our investment options uh, to see how we can get that Roth growing. So really that question, the way I would answer it is, let's look at the investment option that the Roth is currently in and optimize it for their situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another question. Okay, if, if you had over $100,000 in the bank, what's the best asset to purchase? And is it safe to keep that money in the bank? Well, yes. First of all, I'll answer the back end of that question. Uh, I know there's been some news in the press about some of the uh, recent concerns in the financial, some financial institutions, but the bulk and the majority of financial institutions are in good stead. They're, they're reputable and they're uh, also, uh, if they're insured by FDIC insurance or an insurance mechanism, 
then you'll be protected. So remember, you have that protection and that protection does work. It really does work. Uh, we've actually had some clients that uh, were part of the, that had monies actually at one of the recently failed institutions and they've actually already received their money back to pure uh, with interest. So that FDIC insurance does work and it is there for that reason, for protection. Now to come back to your first part of your question is they had over $100,000 in the bank. What's the best asset to purchase? Well, I would, first of all, one of the first things to do is talk through what do you need the money for, right? It's always your objectives. How long do you need the money invested? And is there anything earmarked for that money in the short term? So the key is, is it a short term decision or a longer term decision? Also, <clears throat> is there a need for it? Do you have enough money set aside currently for emergencies? So if there was an emergency, would you need this asset to be liquidated? Because some things are very liquid and some things are not very liquid. So the key is we have to understand the liquidity needs that you have. Um, and then the taxability, right? Uh, are you in a higher bracket or a low bracket? Uh, that will also impact what decision and what vehicles we may look at or recommend because we want to make sure we select what's the best for you on a taxation basis. I think we can agree on this. It's not necessarily how much money you make on, uh, on the interest. It's how much money we keep, right? So we want to make sure we're maximizing the earnings on an after-tax basis where we can. Another question here. Okay, with volatility in the market currently, would it be better to move assets to gold or cash reserves until things settle down? Well, Michael, do you want to cover that one? Yeah, great question. We have advertisements on TV and the radio in regards to gold. Um, I'm mm -hmm. just going to take you back to the jelly bean chart. It's very hard to predict the future um, and what's yeah. going to be the best sector next year. Throughout history, there's all types of turmoil in the world. And uh, I think the key thing is just keep a diversified approach. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we got two minutes left. Let's even go to this one. Uh, who or where do you recommend first time home buyers go for advice and guidance through the process? Oh, wonderful. Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say right here at 1AZ Credit Union, they have some great, great, the, all of the mortgage lenders and the mortgage team can stand ready, willing, and help uh, answer questions. Just call in and say that you're uh, exploring uh, home purchasing so ideas and loans. And trust me, one of the mortgage lenders that can talk to you and give you some great education, but also give you some advice and you know, uh, what can you afford and really re re realistically uh, uh, have as far as debt loads so that you can manage your life and still live a life, right? You don't want to be too house poor. But the most important thing is making sure you get good counsel and good answers. So I would seek out, and it, it could be One Easy Wealth or One Easy Credit Union, or it could be another institution that you uh, use. But most important is seek good counsel from an, ad an advisor in that area when it comes to home buying for guidance. Uh, question, uh, maybe this will be our last one, Michael, is okay. okay. Do you prefer stocks or mutual funds as an investment? Um, I think there's a right approach and a right use for, for both options. Mm -hmm. But in general, owning mutual funds tend to provide more diversification than owning an individual stock because a mutual fund is a basket of, of stocks. So, um, you know, I think it depends on your situation, but that's generally the, the difference between the, the two. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you're right. I'll tell you, um, there's lots of great questions here. I'm looking down at the list of the list. Mike, I wish we had more time, but we're out of time, folks. Uh, we're up against the hour. Thank you all for being on this uh, webinar. I really do appreciate it. Again, if you have questions, please email those in and we will follow up and answer those directly to you and for you. Okay. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you again, Michael, for your insights and your presentation and joining me today. Uh, for those that are watching and listening, thank you for joining. We hope our discussion today has been helpful to provide you some insights on how to build a better financial future, whether you're in your 30s, 40s, or 50s. We here at 1AZ Wealth Management welcome your feedback and comments. So please email us with com comments and actually uh, any ideas, webinar topics, we're always interested in hearing. 
what topic do you have an interest in? For example, the topic we're going to do in May, we've had a number of people say, what do I do with my rollover money? Or where do I do with my money in my old 401k plan? What do I do? How do I do a tax? What's my tax issues? So hence, we created a webinar just on that topic in May. It's that kind of feedback that's really important. So I urge you to give us that feedback. And we also are ready to stand willing and able for second opinions. Many people that have come to us already have a plan or already have some steps they've taken, but they want a second opinion. And you know what? I urge you, please, a second opinion is valuable and can give you great insights. So I urge you and I encourage you to give us a call. Uh, call us at 877. 566-0517 or and visit our website at 1azwealth.com. And actually, when you look at the advisors, you can click on one and actually set up a conference call uh, or schedule a meeting with any of them at your convenience. So it's really important that you take those first steps now. So I hope and I thank you for, so much for joining us today. Again, uh, all of us here at 1AZ Wealth, we, we want to wish you the very best for 2023 for a very safe, healthy, and wealthy year ahead. Again, thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you in the next webinars that we have coming up in the rest of the year. Take care. Bye-bye.